Uh, let, let me start here, if I may, with a quote. Um, Just to be clear, given recent drivel online, Comet 3i Atlas is a comet made of carbon dioxide and water ices and bits of other stuff. It is entirely natural in origin, its orbit is as expected, and it will whiz around the sun and then disappear off into the galaxy again. Uh, that's Professor Brian Cox, uh, astrophysicist much beloved of the British people, um, telling you that you are wrong in providing drivel when you um, suggest that this is anything other than a comet. Well, Brian Cox did not write a single scientific paper about 3i Atlas. He is a commentator. And uh, when uh, playing soccer, we know that there are soccer players on the field and there are commentators. I'm on the field. I wrote 11 scientific papers about 3i Atlas. And mm -hmm. the main difference between a player and a commentator is that only the player can score a goal. Yes, but the but the uh, the spectators, but let me but the, let, the spectators let me Mr. Loeb, can also see when someone's having a bad game. And I think Mr. Cox, to put it politely, as a as a professor of particle physics, is suggesting that you're you're having a stinker. Well, that's not true because he is not addressing the ten anomalies about this object that I pointed out. The question to ask him is, how do you explain the fact that there is a chance of one in a few hundred for this object trajectory to be aligned with the plane of the planets, making stinker? Conclusive statements is very easy. Explaining anomalies is much more difficult. So on that, you, uh, wait a yeah, second. Let, sorry, uh, would you allow me of course, to of please course. explain my point of view? Of course. Okay. Three I Atlas shows ten anomalies. The first one that I pointed out just a few days after it was discovered is that it's very big. It's at least thirty-three billion tons based on the fact that it didn't change course even though it lost mass during its uh, journey and that means five kilometers in diameter this is a million times more mass than the first interstellar object and we are talking about the third mm -hmm. so how come we haven't seen a million small ones before we see a big one in fact i did a calculation that there is not enough rocky material in interstellar space to deliver such a giant object into the inner solar system over the past decade. We would expect it once per 10,000 years or longer. So that raises the possibility that maybe it has nothing to do with the reservoir of rocky material in interstellar space. And I asked Brian Cox to please attend to the anomaly of the large mass of this object and the fact that it's aligned with the plane of the planets around the sun and the fact that it sheds nickel with very little iron, a feature that we only find in nickel alloys that are made industrially, and the fact that there was a jet pointed towards the sun during July and August, but not a cometary tail that is headed away from the sun, the way we see for comets. And the fact that when this object came closest to the sun on October 29th, it actually exhibited non-gravitational acceleration. What does that, for the, what does that mean, non-gravitational acceleration? It means that there was a deviation from a trajectory that we expected based on gravity alone. And so for a comet, it means the comet must lose a substantial fraction of its mass in order to get a sure. recoil from the rocket I effect. See. And that means a massive cloud of gas weighing more than 5 billion tons around it after it passed closest to the sun. And in fact, there were first images that were obtained over the past few days. They do not show a distinct cometary tail that would be a natural consequence okay. of having such a cloud of gas and dust. So what I'm trying to explain is the truth is in the details, not in big statements made by commentators. And before we explain the anomalies in a simple way, we should all be curious about what yes. this object might be. 
definitely people are. Because, uh, because uh, let me explain. The foundation of science is humility in tr trying to gain new knowledge out of curiosity sure. and not in arrogance based on expertise. Okay. Can I just can I pick up on a couple of things that you said there that I find very interesting? So um, you talk there about uh, the elliptical plane, the uh, the flat orbit path along which most planets, including Earth, move around the sun. Um, your suggestion is that this aligns within to within five degrees of that and that there is a likelihood of that being the case of one in 500. So in that sense, very unlikely. But in the unlikelihood of any object passing anywhere near us from interstellar space, the odds of that happening must be way, way, way bigger than one in five hundred. So, as much as one in five hundred is a is a uh, you know a small chance, everything in space is a small chance. Do you know what I mean? It's not small in the context of the universe, perhaps. No, that's not true because the first two interstellar objects came at a large angle, and the disk of the Milky Way galaxy, the plane of the Milky Way galaxy, is misaligned with the ecliptic plane of the planets by 60 degrees. So there is no reason to expect a preference along the ecliptic plane of the planets around the sun. And we do see objects coming at all angles. Why would this massive interstellar object arrive so that it comes close to Mars, Venus, and then Jupiter with a very small likelihood? But what do we mean close to? Within tens of millions of kilometers right which is in a astronomical terms that's close is it that's that's it's very close in the context of the uh, of the solar system which is uh, uh, much much orders of magnitude larger than that and so uh, but i should say this is a gift from interstellar space because all of our telescopes and uh, uh, orbiters around planets are in this plane and yes. given that the object is bright it's a, 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 an amazing opportunity for us to study it. Uh, sure. And uh, even if it turns out that it is indeed uh, just a natural object, uh, we could learn much more about the environments that produce uh, such objects, which must be very different from the solar system. Is it, um, how satisfactory to you is it that the explanation of the reason um, why it's got this particular plane is you hit your one in 500. You got lucky. It's just as it is. Yeah, but that would be the case if we had hundreds of objects that we've looked at, but we looked only at three. This is the third one. From interstellar space. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then there's the, the you, 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 you make the point about the tail. You would expect to see a large tail of, of, of sort of uh, melting ice and, and rock and stuff. Um, is that because, well, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So... We, we might not I'm have not, seen it. Is, that, is, that the, is, is, the, is the reason that it's not there because we haven't seen it yet? So let me first explain my point of view. My point so, of view is that this object most likely is a natural comet, but we don't have the luxury, as we often do in astrophysics, to say this is the most likely interpretation. Let's forget about any alternative. Why don't we have that? Because when we deal with an exploding star billions of light years away, it has no impact on the future of humanity. However, if we have a visitor to our backyard that may enter through our front door, we really need to monitor that visitor and get as much data as possible, given the possibility that it might be technological in origin, uh, because uh, uh, that poses a threat to humanity. And also, uh, it's something we must consider because it will revise the way we perceive our place in the universe. Of course it would. It would be absolutely amazing and astonishing and terrifying at the same time. But you're coming... At the, because it strikes me that uh, lots of people would like to use what you're saying and the questions you're asking as a way of saying that the conventional science is just wrong about the fundamental basis of what this is. But it seems like what you're saying to me here is you think it's a comet it's likely it's a comet it's just that there are some things that are part of it that needs further explanation in order to truly understand how and why this has come into being yeah what i'm saying is that there is a small likelihood that it might be technological because of the anomalies and we have to clear up those anomalies yep. by getting as much data as possible and the the uh, intelligence agencies are very much uh, accustomed to wasting or spending most of their funds on events that are unlikely and never materialize just because they have huge implications for 
society. And I'm suggesting that the way scientists think about problems is inadequate in this context, uh, because it could be a black swan event that you assign a small probability for it, but nevertheless, it has major implications for uh, the future. And so we must consider seriously the possibility of technological objects for a simple reason. We launched five probes to interstellar space, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, and New Horizons. We keep polluting space with technological gadgets, and we only had 50 years of space exploration. Just imagine another civilization that had millions or billions of years. Most stars are billions of years old, older than the sun, and uh, there are 100 billion of them in the Milky Way galaxy, and a, a fair fraction of them have mm. a planet the size of the Earth, roughly at the same separation. So it is arrogant of us to assume that Elon Musk is the most accomplished space entrepreneur since the Big Bang 13.8 <laughs> billion years ago. And what Brian Cox is trying to argue is that we should adopt the most naive interpretation that everything in the sky is familiar, is similar to the rocks, the icy rocks that we found in our backyard. And my point is that every now and then we might have a tennis ball that was thrown by a neighbor. And unless we are aware to that possibility, we would be blind to it. Uh, just to give you an example, on January 2nd, 2025, there was a near earth object that the Minor Planet Center, the official organization supported by the International Ast uh, Astronomical Union, uh, declared as a near-Earth asteroid. They gave it a name, and within a day they realized, oh, sorry, this, this one actually follows the path of the Tesla Roadster car that was launched by SpaceX in 2018. And therefore, it's not a rock, it's a car. But if they didn't know about the path of the Tesla Roadster car, they would declare it as an asteroid, as a rock. And so when astronomers tell you it's most likely an asteroid, most likely a comet, you should just assume that this is their vocabulary of describing anything in the sky. Yes. And uh, most uh, interestingly, in the context of Oumuamua, the first interstellar mm -hmm. object, there was no cometary tail whatsoever, no gas, no dust around it. Nevertheless, the consensus of comet experts today is that it's a dark comet, meaning a comet where the tail is invisible. And I feel like the kid in Hans Christian Andersen's tale who said, the emperor has no clothes. And the adults in the room next to me say, oh no, mm -hmm. Oumuamua has clothes. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a but, cometary tail, it's just invisible. Yes. But, and again, to come back to your, your earlier point, um, it's again, you're asking for endeavor and scientific uh, questioning and, and to hold lots of possibilities in your head at the same time. And try not to work lots. I'm all holding two, not lots. Okay, so two possibilities which we know describe space objects. How do we know that? Because rocks falling from the sky were realized after 1803 sure. when there was a meteor shower in Liège. Since then, the experts agreed that rocks can fall from the sky. Before that, they ridiculed it. And now they insist that everything in the sky is icy rocks, even though humanity polluted space with technological yes. gadgets. But and we know that there are billions of Earth-Sun analogs, yes. many houses on our cosmic street that could have produced out of a the soup of chemicals that existed on them, intelligence just like ours, assuming that we are at the top of the food chain in the Milky Way galaxy is it's arrogant. No, I, I am saying that Brian Cox takes an arrogant point of view by saying it must be a comet without attending to future data. But, but, but Mr. Loeb, isn't, the, isn't part of the discussion here too, not just, as you say, it would be, uh, uh, you know, lacking in humility to say that thing there is definitely a comet and i know it's a comet because everything that's passed so far has been a comet right. the, the but the reality is this has been looked at studied uh, lots and lots of different scientific bodies have come to the conclusion that whilst we might not be able to explain yet this bit this bit or that bit the overwhelming probability is this is a comet as you yourself say it's not an overwhelming probability i i i just explained the number of mm -hmm anomalies that this object exhibits. And I'm suggesting that in the coming weeks, we'll get the best data because uh, it will come closest to Earth on December 19th. 
And uh, we will have the ability of using hundreds of observatories around the globe. Uh, that was, in fact, the campaign announced by the International Asteroid Warning uh, Network. And so there will be a campaign for two months of observing it, getting the best data. And what uh, Brian Cox is trying to say is, forget about it. I know the answer. He never worked, by the way, in this field. He works in particle physics, mm -hmm. yet he expresses an opinion that is very strong and tries to suppress curiosity about what the nature of this object is. I'm saying that even if it is a natural comet, it's a comet of a type that we've never witnessed before because of its size, because of its composition not being water-rich. The comet experts argued it must be uh, water-rich mm -hmm. immediately mm -hmm. after it was discovered. And so the factories that make such objects uh, are not known to us uh, to a good uh, approximation, and we better learn from, from it. And even if it's natural, I say we missed an opportunity to actually land on it and collect some materials to bring them back to laboratories on Earth, uh, and because that would have allowed us to examine the materials and ask whether the building blocks of life as we know it may exist uh, near other stars. And the, the astrobiology community, the mainstream experts on the search for life, are obsessed with searching for microbes through the chemical fingerprints that we might find in the atmospheres of exoplanets remotely, investing more than $10 billion in that effort as the highest priority in astrophysics right now. This is the mainstream. And I'm saying there is a scientific revolution waiting for us in the context of interstellar objects, even if they are natural rocks, we could examine mm -hmm. directly the material. It would have taken us millions to billions of years to visit those planetary systems and bring materials back to Earth. And these objects traveled for millions to billions of years through the Milky Way galaxy, arrived to our backyard. So let's be curious and examine them. Let's intercept them, land on them. Let's get a close-up photograph. If we had that, there would be no argument about the nature of the object or the nature of previous sure. interstellar objects like Oumuamua, which was also very puzzling.